Hello and welcome everyone to our webinar. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Um, yeah, so for today we will be discussing uh, Fronia's grid and system uh, protection. So basically uh, in this webinar we shall be discussing um, how Fronios implements grid and system protection in its uh, inverters. So to do this with me today is uh, my colleague, David Mwangi, who is a technical sales advisor for Eastern Africa. He is based in Nairobi, Kenya. And of course, myself, Cyprian Okolo, the technical sales advisor for Western Africa, based in Lagos, Nigeria. So um, just to give us a brief of uh, the regions we cover, uh, the areas shaded red, uh, the areas of the region covered by David Mwangi, as you can see listed. And then for me, it's uh, the areas or the regions covered in blue. And then for the regions covered in green, is uh, that's the region covered by uh, Mohamed Sidat, who is the technical sales advisor for Southern Africa. Um, in addition, I just want to tell us about uh, uh, the structure of um, our partnership. So we have the FSP Plus. Uh, these are sales partners that offer after-sales services, which includes technical support. And then, of course, uh, we have these distributors um, spread out across the sub-Saharan African region. Uh, they keep um, all stocks. They keep stocks of all the replacement parts. And then, uh, of course, uh, these parts can be obtained uh, from our Fronius uh, System Partner Plus, or fondly called FSP Plus. And then, um, where can you find them in uh, the sub -Saharan, sub Saharan Africa region? So, for South Africa, we have Inomatic Solar and IBC Solar. Uh, for Namibia, uh, FSP Plus is uh, Radio Electronic. And then, One Stop Solar is the FSP Plus for Zimbabwe. And then in Ghana, we have Tino Solutions. And then for Kenya, we have CAT, Greenspark, and Knight Energy. Uh, also to state here that uh, Knight Energy is also the FSP Plus for Uganda. And then in Madagascar, we have Madagrid Power. For Mali, we have Sonikara. And then last but not least, of course, is Components and Solutions Rack, which is uh, the FSP Plus for Nigeria. So having said that, we'll now look at the agenda for today. Uh, first off, we'll be starting uh, with the general information on what grid and system uh, protection means. Uh, going forward, I will be uh, um, stating it as uh, GS protection, that is grid and system protection. So we'll be looking at how it works with the Fronius in Batter, and then I'll go through installation of the GS protection for uh, different inverter uh, ranges. We're talking about the snap inverters, the Gen 24s and the uh, Tauros, and then we'll be looking at how it can be piled with uh, SPDs. And then, of course, after that, we'll be looking at um, taking a look at the advantages and then uh, ad advanced grid features, and then, of course, give you further information. So, uh, without further ado, let's now continue. Uh, basically, giving us um, a brief information of what grid and system protection is all about. So basically, uh, grid and system protection is um, a scheme or a protected device, if you may, which uh, constantly monitors the voltage and frequency of the grid for a given specified switch off conditions. So um, basically, the GS protection disconnects the PV system failsafe by acting or actuating the interface switch. We will be um, seeing more of these interface switches uh, in the subsequent slide. Uh, the interface switch usually consists of two electrical switch gears that are connected in series. Um, yeah, so we actually have variants of uh, the, the GS protection, which will be seen pretty soon. But before then, um, I'd like us to know that uh, there are normative requirements for grid and system protection, uh, which differ from country to country. Uh, so uh, for simplicity and neutrality, per se, we will be uh, taking into cognizance uh, the uh, GS protection uh, 
B D E A R N four one zero five, which is implemented in Germany. So um, basically, grid operators also sometimes uh, require different versions or settings. So this would have to be ascertained before uh, it can be implemented. It has to be ascertained from the grid operators uh, before implementation. Uh, so like I was saying, we have um, basically three variants, and then we'll be looking at them in the coming slides, which we have the first one here. So the first is uh, the case where we have the inverter integrated uh, GS protection. Um, typically, um, I guess some of us might not know, but uh, GS protection is usually integrated in every typical inverter. It uh, consists of uh, a GS protection uh, device, and uh, this now uh, actuates the integrated interface switch, as you can see here illustrated. So um, from this illustration, we can see that it is embedded or integrated inside the inverter. So in this case, uh, no external GS protection is required. And uh, basically, for this, uh, the range per se is uh, uh, up to 30 kVA. So for inverters up to 30 kVA or plant capacity up to 30 kVA, we have this implemented in the inverter. So the second variable is uh, the centrally realized grid and system protection. Uh, in this case, the relay, uh, grid and system protection relay and interface switch. So in this case, um, we have uh, the central GS protection relay situated externally and then acting on a central interface switch, which uh, disconnects uh, the inverter in the case of a fault. So just going through the detail, uh, from a pl certain plant size uh, between uh, 30 to 135 kilowatts, a central GS protection uh, should be implemented. Uh, in this uh, particular protection scheme, uh, it has a central GS protection, protection relay, which acts or actuates the central interface switch, as Elia said. Uh, both components must be installed additionally or ex externally, as seen illustrated in this case. And then the third um, grid, and protection, grid and system protection uh, variant is, uh, in fact, the one implemented by uh, Fonius, which is a central grid and system protection relay controls uh, the inverter integrated interface switch. So as you can see from this illustration, the central GS protection relay um, in, is interconnected with the interface switch and, of course, uh, controls it or actuates it. So the second possibility for compliance with the standard is a central, just uh, giving a, a brief explanation, is a central GS protection relay which acts on the interface switch integrated inside the inverter. So in this case, no additional interface switch has to be installed. As you can see, there's no interface switch is, uh, needed to be installed. Just the protection relay, uh, which now is connected or interconnected to the interface switch inside the inverter. So these are the variants of, uh, um, uh, variants of uh, grid and system uh, protection that can be implemented. Great, so now let's look at uh, the functionality and then uh, application uh, devices per se. So um, because of the fact that uh, in, in these cases, um, it's basically commercial inverters that are uh, usually implemented. But of course, it is not limited to commercial inverters. So meaning that uh, even residential inverters can also have uh, GS uh, protection. So for this case, uh, we have, uh, it actually covers all our inverter um, classes or ranges. So it includes uh, the Fronia, Simo, and Echo from 10 to 27 uh, kilowatts, uh, the Fronia Gen 24 Plus inverter, 6 to 10 kilowatts, and then of course, uh, the Fronia Saro, 50 to 100 kilowatts. So taking a look at how this is implemented, we're going to be uh, looking at uh, an SLD as a single line diagram. And in this case, we are using, for this example, we're using the Bender GS protection with the Fronius Echo. So uh, to make it a bit clearer, we have a, a single line diagram. 
of um, the contacts of this GS protection device. So this is the Bender GS protection device. And then this is a single light diagram of its contacts, as you can see in this case and uh, indicated by my pointer. So um, basically how the contacts operates, uh, uh, for every relay, we have uh, three contacts, which is the common, the normally open, and the normally closed contacts. So in this case, terminal 11 is the common, terminal 12 is the normally closed contact, terminal 14 is the normally open contact, as can be seen. So because they should be connected in series, uh, 14 is now looped to 21, which is the second relay, the contact of the second relay. So this 21 is the common, 22 is a normally closed contact, and 24 is a normally open contact. So this is now wired to the relay that now actuates the S0 switch situated on the reservoir of the Pronius inverter. So uh, this is basically how it is set up in the <clears throat> case where you have um, multiple inverters uh, to uh, interconnect. So this is basically showing us how they are. Uh, of course, you would need um, an AC to DC converter to um, provide power supply and uh, buffering for the relays. So that was the case for SNAP inverter. So um, if we now have a, um, a case where we have, um, we need to implement GS protection for Gen24 and ECHO, um, as we would know, um, the Gen24 inverter does not have um, an S0 switch. Uh, it only comes with a, a WSD uh, function. So we now implement uh, the GS protection using WSD function. So that's uh, basically the difference between the Gen24 uh, GS protection and the Snap Inverter GS protection. So um, every other thing remains the same. So uh, the connection goes to WSD in the case of uh, the Gen24 Plus inverter, and of course also the Tauro because uh, they both have the same type of um, data communication card. And then uh, of course, if you have uh, the Snap Inverter, the signal or the control signals goes to the S0 switch. Okay, now in a case where you have only uh, Gen24 inverters or Tauros. Um, in this case, you don't need a buffer. Um, all you need to do is just to connect directly to the WSD uh, terminals and then loop it serially. Um, of course, you would have a master and then the others would now become slaves. So we've seen how uh, we can have one as a master and the subsequent ones as slave in the next slide. So um, we will be looking at it in the subsequent slides um, where we'll be dealing with the installation of the grid and system protection. So in order to achieve this, um, let's first of all take a look at uh, some technical requirements. Uh, so it is recommended here that uh, we should uh, observe uh, the national regulations for the selection of a particular GS protection uh, components, uh, always uh, clarify with uh, always clarify the admissibility with your grid operator beforehand uh, to ensure that uh, you have all the grids uh, specifications that are recommended for GS protection. And then uh, for the relays to be used, please uh, ensure that the relay is installed inside the inverter. If this is not possible, then uh, nearby. But of course, we recommend that uh, it's installed uh, inside the inverter in the case of uh, snap inverters. For snap inverters, we uh, have um, provision made for installation of um, components uh, with the provision of uh, DIN rail. Okay, so, um, so in this case, for the installation of the relay inside the inverter, we have a minimum width and depth of 110 and 66 uh, mm respectively and please ensure that the maximum ambient temperature uh, does not exceed 70 degrees celsius and also ensure that the dielectric strength between the coil and contact of the relay 
is greater than or equal to 6 kV. But uh, the good news is that uh, most um, relays actually meet this uh, um, requirement. So let's now go to um, the cabling and commissioning um, for of GS protection for snapping batters. So uh, we have um, illustrations here to show us how this is done. Uh, to make it a bit clearer, let's see if we can zoom in a bit so that we can have a clearer view. Great, this is good. Great, so if we now have, uh, let's say this is uh, the relay um, to be installed. Uh, this here is the DIN rail. So we have the relay installed on the DIN rail. Uh, of course, you're going to have uh, your connection cable. This is it with your normally open and uh, common contact connected. So once this is done, uh, mind you, uh, on the background, you can see that uh, it's uh, the snap inverter wall mount bracket. And we know that uh, the wall mount bracket also comes with DC and AC connection uh, terminals, as you can see in the background. So uh, of course, after this is done, we'll have to um, uh, install or place in the inverter cover. So once this is done, you might not have access to this cable. So in order to pass the cable through, you would have to um, break open this um, um, closure here so that you can pass the cable. So once the cable is passed, it's going to look like this. So once you now pass the cable through this opening here, uh, you can now have uh, your cable um, um, cable free to be connected to the S0 switch. Now uh, you would now have to connect your cable to the S0 switch terminal and then uh, plug it in. The S0 switch is located just under the reservoir uh, in the uh, Fronius snap inverter. Great, I believe this is uh, clear enough. So after that is done, uh, after the cabling is done, you would now have to uh, configure it. And this can only be done by accessing the basic menu. Uh, we have um, uh, covered extensively how to access um, uh, access codes uh, on the Fronius Snap Inverter. So for the basic menu, uh, the code is 22742. So by the time uh, you tap on the touch sensitive button of the inverter display uh, five times, it will come up with uh, five zero digits and then you can now use the plus and minus um, um, tabs to impute the code, which is 22742. Once that is done, you press enter, and then it will take you to uh, the section where you uh, configure the uh, GS protection. So it's usually called the input signal. So there, you would now select uh, the external signal function. Once that is selected, you can now go ahead and uh, select for the triggering method, uh, select external stop. So this means um, uh, to start with, it's telling us here that um, it's uh, an external signal that is coming in to uh, perform an operation. And then in this case, it's asking what operation is it coming in to perform? Is the signal coming in to perform? It is coming in to perform a stop. Uh, command, let's say, and then uh, finally, uh, connection type. Connection type is normally closed. That sh should be uh, what uh, should be selected because the normal operation, it's normally closed. When there is a fault, then it uh, automatically clicks or actuates and then uh, goes to normally open position. So for con connection type, we leave it at normally closed. Great. So like I told uh, us earlier that uh, we'll be looking at uh, how the WSD uh, function or WSD terminal is uh, cabled and uh, connected. So uh, to start with, we should ensure that the DIL switch for the WSD is put on the one position. So after that is done, of course, this is located just at the top of uh, the pilot, as you can see. So there's a switch just above it. Make sure it is on the one position, meaning that uh, you have turned it on, per se. And then from the GS protection relay, as you can see, you can now wire the cable terminals to 
the in positive and in negative. Uh, by default, the WSD switch comes bridged, as you can see. So this bridge cable would have to be removed. Then you can now connect um, your GS protection cable to uh, the WSD terminal uh, via the in plus and in minus. Okay, so that's how it's done. Um, in the case where we have multiple inverters, so this is how it's connected. So from the GS protection relay, it goes into the first inverter that has its uh, dial switch uh, on the one position, and then it now goes out from the out terminal, positive and negative, to the next inverter pilot, as you can see. And as we do so, please ensure that for the subsequent inverters in that ring, um, the WSD DIL switch should be in the zero position. So this is the master, while the subsequent ones are the slaves. So this is how uh, the connection uh, is done uh, using uh, the WSD uh, function. Good. Um, yeah, so now take a look at how uh, we implement the parallel use of SPD and GS protection. So in this case, it is possible to actually um, uh, have a parallel operation uh, of uh, using the SPD, that is such protection device, and GS protection. It is actually possible, and uh, this is how it is wired. So here you can see that uh, the signal output is um, connected in series with the GS protection contact. So this is the relay, the GS protection relay, as you can see, is connected in series to or with the uh, SPD uh, type 1 plus 2 um, device. And then from the other end, it's now connected to the WSD uh, terminal. That is, if it's a Gen 24 or Tauro. In case it's um, an echo or maybe a snap inverter, it is, of course, these two points are connected to the S0 switch. So let's now take a look at the advantages that uh, these GS protection uh, for Fronius uh, presents. Um, so asking what the advantages are, uh, with a Fronius inverter, the integrated interface switch can be controlled by an external GS protection uh, relay via an interface. So this, of course, uh, provides um, saving the cost of an external interface switch. Uh, this, of course, works with uh, all uh, uh, ranges of our uh, inverters, be it the Primo, Simo, Echo, Gen24+, Plus, and the Tauro. And then, um, uh, much more importantly, uh, Fronius is the only company with a certification from an accredited testing institute, which is the Beru Veritas. Beru Veritas. And uh, with this, you can be ensured that the GS protection works uh, perfectly. Uh, other saving potentials uh, is that uh, the biggest saving potential is uh, with the external uh, saving with the external interface switch. Uh, depending on the size of the system, this can actually cost up to 2,000 euros, which is quite a lot of uh, money. And then uh, it's simple and quick to implement compared to installing an external coupling switch. Again, this also saves time and cost. And then, of course, it saves space in the main distribution board uh such that uh, no additional costs are uh, incurred for additional switch cabinet or cabinets as the case may be so um that brings me to the end of my part of uh, the presentation i will now be handing over to david Mwangi. but before i do that uh, i would like to ask uh, a poll question um Yes, so the poll question is, I believe we can see it now. Uh, how familiar are you with uh, GS protection? Um, so you can answer, okay, I'm just hearing about it. Uh, I know about it, but not conversant with it. And then uh, I have a good knowledge of it. So please feel free to uh, send your responses and I will be glad to have them. Um, I will be turning uh, closing the poll question in about uh, a couple of seconds, so giving us enough time to um, uh, put in an, uh, our answers. So please keep your answers coming. 
Uh, so I'll be closing it in the next 10 seconds. Okay, thank you very much for your responses. So uh, I will now share the poll answers with you. Yeah, so from what we have here, 64% uh, here says that uh, just hearing about it, and then 36% uh, say that uh, they, knew about, they know about it, but uh, not conversant with it. So I guess it's a, a good thing we have uh, this webinar for us today to learn uh, about uh, GS protection and uh, how they are implemented using the Fronios in Bata. So thank you for your response. Uh, yeah, indeed, appreciated. So at this point, I will be handing over to uh, David Mwangi, who will be taking us on advanced grid features, uh, features that actually make these GS protection implementation uh, a necessity and a possibility. So David, if you're here, please uh, continue from this point. All right, so thank you so much, uh, Cyprian for the first exciting part of today's webinar. So we will now continue and look at um, the advanced grid features that are integrated or implemented in the various Fronius inverters. And uh, to, to start, we are going to evaluate the behavior of voltage in the grid. So what happens uh, when you're being supplied with a voltage from the grid? And as a consumer or several consumers, how does the voltage therefore behave? So as you can see, um, there are quite a number of consumers. Uh, when the grid comes in, uh, there is a particular behavior for the grid. And this is going to continue all the way down to, to the end. So the very first consumer here has a very stable voltage. And as we continue, the voltage starts uh, dropping. Uh, so consumer number three is getting a slightly lower voltage in comparison to the very first one who is just next to the transformer. And then at the very end, we have a, a more significant drop. As you can see, we are almost operating at below 5% the initial voltage that was coming from the transformer. So this is in a purely grid connected uh, supply without any PV systems installed. On the flip side, we can see the effect of installing PV systems in a grid connected formation. Um, so in a similar manner, we start analyzing what is happening to the grid voltage uh, with the interaction with PV systems, uh, mounted maybe residential setups or even commercial systems. So as we can see with the first installation and interaction uh, point, the grid voltage is increasing uh, slightly compared to the uh, transformer voltage that is coming through. And then with the next uh, PV system, then we have uh, another increment in the grid voltage. And as we go along, the voltage can also increase quite dramatically to the point whereby the last household is uh, getting an abnormally high voltage. And therefore, because of these increases or decreases of voltage, depending on the distance of connection from the uh, grid transformer, the PV inverter must have some embedded uh, regulation or parameters that are able to react accordingly, depending on what is happening to the grid. Um, and therefore, we can now look at uh, several things. Because uh, as you can see at this point, once you exit plus 10% of the grid voltage, then uh, it becomes hazardous even for the operation of uh, common loads or appliances in the household. So therefore, let's evaluate uh, a three-phase power fit. And just to give you some basic understanding of what is happening with the power supply. And we can see that um, the power supply in a three-phase kind of configuration is symmetrical in all the three phases, especially once you bring an inverter into the picture. So. The total sum of all the currents within the three phases uh, should be equal to uh, the neutral line current. And this therefore means that the currents in the three phases should be cutting each other out because 
the three faces are operating 120 degrees out of phase from each other. In comparison, a single phase supply uh, looks something like this, and therefore uh, we can see that also in the neutral phase, we are registering some level of current. And therefore, um, we can see that there is an increase uh, of the current to a figure that is about three times higher. So if you can say that you want to create 10 kilowatt output uh, in, in three phase, the amount of power of, or current that you need to build into the grid to, to be able to give you 10 kilowatt output in single phase is going to require three times the amount of current in a single phase, in a three phase configuration in comparison. So therefore, uh, we can also conclude that uh, the current in the in the neutral conductor also causes an increase in the voltage, and therefore three times the current and twice the voltage drop uh, drop in a single phase system compared to a three phase system, and therefore the resulting voltage increase uh, for single phase systems could be up to a multiple of six. So in summary, when you're looking at a single phase to three phase system. Um, single phase systems can cause more voltage increase, but on the flip side, several single phase systems in a local grid can compensate one another statistically, that is uh, the increase and the decrease of the voltages. This can be cut out uh, within a grid. The only thing that we can also men mention is the fact that it is not dangerous to have too high voltages or very high voltages in a grid. The, the worst can happen is that the inverters or the grid itself can shut down, but therefore several measures can be taken as implemented in the Fronius inverters to make sure that we have some flexibility in terms of operating depending on different grid parameters. So also some grid operators include the option uh, to change the connection of a single inverter, single phase inverter at a later date in their connection agreement, depending on the behavior of the grid that the, operate, the inverter is operating in. Something else that is very, very important for PV inverters is the behavior as far as reactive power is, is concerned. So what happens with reactive power feed? So we have three components of uh, power that we know are going to be uh, circulating within a PV system or a grid setup. And these are from uh, the apparent power then we have the component of active power or what is actually doing the work within the grid. And then we have the reactive power component and this does not do any work within the grid. So the apparent power is simply obtained by multiplying the available voltage within the grid times the current. And therefore this is what we can see represented here as S. And then we have the active power, the component of the apparent power that is actually doing the actual work may be running a motor or operating the electronics within the household. And this is obtained by adding the cost fee factor or the power factor of the apparent power component. And therefore the active power, which is rep represented here by P, is obtained by multiplying the voltage times the current and the power factor. And then you have the um, reactive power component that is represented here by Q. And this is also uh, obtained by looking at what is the component of the apparent power multiplied by sine phi of the, of the apparent power. So this is the component of reactive power that needs also to be taken into account because uh, depending on whether the voltage is increasing or decreasing once you connect an inverter, the inverter can play a role by playing a role with the or playing around with the reactive power to try to sort of uh, stabilize the frequency and the voltage within the grid. To obtain the power factor that is operating within the system, this can be done simply by looking at what is the component of the active power that you're able to get out of the inverter or the grid, and then the apparent power that is being supplied. And this will result in a cost fee, in a purely uh, uh, cynic, uh, sinusoidal value. In terms of the active uh, power operation, um, the active power, especially within the production of, of a PV inverter, is always the same as the DC output multiplied by what is the efficiency of this inverter. And therefore, 
as per this expression, we can see that the AC power is the same as DC power, that is the component of power that you're getting from the PV array, multiplied by the efficiency of the uh, PV inverter. And therefore, that is the component of power that you're going to see in your grid. Then we also come into play and look at the component of both active and reactive power in operation. So the active power component is still the same as the DC output times the efficiency. But we have now an additional component that is the reactive uh, with a power factor. And therefore, the component Q here is, uh, or cost fee, uh, can be controlled by the inverter independently of the DC power. So this is where it is very important to take, to take note that the active power is the same as the DC power that is coming from the PV array multiplied by the efficiency of the inverter. However, the reactive power can be adjusted independently of how much power is coming from the DC side of the supply or the PV array. So what is the net effect therefore of the reactive power within uh, a grid? As you can see here, we have several set points that are going to lead us into an overexcited uh, response for, from a reactive power, which is going to cause an increase in the voltage. And then in addition to that, uh, and this increase in the voltage, we are calling it uh, capacitive reactive power. And then we have an ad another excited response, which is going to cause a decrease in the grid voltage. And this is the element of the reactive power that is operating in the uh, inductive segment of uh, the cycle. So therefore, um, what are the possible inverter settings to counter these effects of reactive power and to make sure that the inverter does not trip uh, too often? In terms of the operating range or operating area of the inverter, we have uh, the definition that is governed by the active power and the reactive power. And the limits are therefore defined in terms of the how far the inverter can go by the nominal apparent power and cost fee, which is the power factor. So in this uh, diagram or figure over here, we can see that we have a white curve which is representing the nominal power, apparent power, and then we have uh, at the bottom what can be the relative reactive power from minus 100% to positive 100%. And then the, di the dimension of the actual power within the system that is doing work as far as active power is concerned. So um, the fixed value uh, adjustment of uh, reactive power is possible. And this will happen depending on uh, the grid voltage and whether it's increasing or decreasing. For instance, in this case, we can see that uh, we are going to adjust uh, this uh, remotely. And the figure that we are going to operate is from a figure of uh, 0 0.9 inductive. And once this is done, then you're operating in an area, as I mentioned before, whereby the inverter is trying to counteract a decrease in the grid voltage and playing around with the power factor. Therefore, the inverter can operate from a relative uh, uh, reactive power of minus 100%. And adjusting the power factor or the cost fee, we are going to come or to counter the effect of a decreasing or increasing voltage, depending on whether the, 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 the incoming grid voltage is behaving as inductive or capacitive. So in a reactive power operation, the max, the max active power is less than in a purely active operation. And therefore we are talking about if the cost or the power factor is one. And therefore the, power, the maximum power within the grid will be obtained as I had mentioned before, uh, by multiplying the apparent power with the power factor. And if you are to consider this uh, to be able to size your inverter depending on uh, the effects of the incoming uh, voltage from the grid, you might decide actually to do a slightly bigger inverter if the power factor is going to be slightly lower than uh, normal, then you might want to in uh, install a slightly bigger inverter 
to be able to counter the effects of these fluctuations within the grid. And then uh, just another point is that when you are designing your inverter size uh, within the Fronia solar configurator, all these uh, variation or uh, variables are already taken into account. And therefore the results you get uh, as far as the connection of PV power to the inverter already have taken into account what are the variations that are possible as far as reactive power is concerned. And then we can also have a situation whereby the reactive power uh, is, or the power factor, is uh, uh, changed depending on the active power component of the grid. So as we can see here, we have a situation whereby we are starting to operate within uh, the inductive or other excited uh, portion. If our power factor is going above 0 0.5, and then we can also go into uh, a capacitive operation if the power factor is going uh, below uh, 0 0.5 and therefore trying to increase uh, the voltage that is uh, coming to the grid. Therefore, the inverter in this manner is going to play a very big role to ensure that you have a stable grid and prevent the inverter from disconnecting because the, the, the thing you want to see is that the inverter continues to give you yield uh, regardless of these fluctuations. But of course, there are several set points that are going to make sure that the inverter does not operate uh, within uh, very varying uh, voltage uh, inputs. In terms of the voltage, we can also have uh, a voltage dependent uh, control of the reactive power uh, uh, segment of the grid. And this can be defined by several factors, uh, as we can see here. So on one scale, we have uh, the grid voltage, which can be anywhere from zero to 110% of what can be the incoming voltage from the grid. And then the, def uh, the defined set points could uh, be something like this, as an example, that you can say if the voltage is about 95% of what should be coming in, then you want your reactive power to be plus 32%. And then if you're operating at 97% of the rate of the voltage, uh, of the grid voltage, then you set your reactive power at 0%. And then similarly at 104% of the grid voltage, you want your uh, reactive power to be at 0%. However, if you go towards now a grid voltage of 105%, you want to increase your reactive, the reactive power to minus 32%. And therefore, at minus 32% of reactive power, we can see that we are operating within the inductive uh, area of the curve. And at plus 32%, we are going to be operating in the capacitive segment of the, uh, of the operation curve as far as the grid, grid voltage is concerned. And therefore, the injection of this kind of uh, reactive power into the grid is going to counter the the grid voltage and frequency similarly to be able to make it more stable for the inverter to continue operating. The other consideration for controlling the reactive power and therefore to counter the, the changing uh, grid uh, voltages would be to control it using uh, the active power components of the inverter. And this can also be defined by four char characteristic points as you can see here. So we have from uh, zero, we can see that the, when the power, active power is 0%, we want also our act, reactive power to be at 0%, all the way down to 50% uh, active power, whereby we are keeping our reactive power to zero. But once you get to the production 95% of active power, then we can inject a bit of uh, inductive reactive power into the grid to make sure that the grid voltage does not increase too much uh, with increasing production of the inverter. So this is critical as we have seen in the beginning, depending on your position on the grid line. If you are very near to the grid line and the inverters are producing near maximum capacity, there is a slight risk that uh, the grid voltage could actually increase uh, due to the production of the inverter. And the other, therefore the inverter with the embedded uh, regulation can be able to counter this by injecting an inductive reactive power component into the grid and therefore stabilizing the, uh, the grid voltage. 
Another consideration also is what would happen if we want to control the reactive power as well as the active power components using the grid voltage. So this is also very possible within the inverter setup so that depending on what is happening uh, with the grid, we can have uh, an adjustment, especially with the reactive power and be able to counter that based on what is the line voltage and the inverter also accordingly adjusts, as we can see the blue line, the maximum active power that is being produced uh, to, to be fed into the grid. So this output reduction uh, will be done by changing the voltage at the DC input, especially as far as active power uh, is concerned. And this uh, also output change as a function of the module characteristics. So uh, as we know already, we have the dynamic peak manager that is able to streamline the DC voltage to the inverter. And therefore for the inverter to ensure that we have uh, as if, uh, a sort of stable uh, active power coming out of the inverter, the module characteristics of also have to come into play and look at at which point we are feeding uh, the MPP voltage uh, from the modules to the inverter for the inverter to guarantee that the maximum power at the maximum power point is as stable as possible. Let's now look at the trip limits uh, and look at what what is the behavior of the voltage and the frequency. So these trip limits, uh, I think my colleague uh, Cyprian had already mentioned, these are country specific. And therefore, one of the key requirements would be that no grid operation outside of some specified conditions. Also that grid operators have to guarantee a specific grid quality. Uh, some example is EN501660. So, and this requires that there is disconnection from the grid if some limits are exceeded. And these limits are mostly with relation to the voltage and the frequency. So the PV inverter or PV inverters have to have synchronization to the incoming grid voltage and frequency. And then within certain set limits, the inverter must know whether to continue operating or not. So in some countries, depending on the plant size, uh, especially if you give uh, an example of Germany, because this is where a lot of uh, uh, guidelines are developed, even for the international market. So if a system is above 30 kVA, then the regulation as already explained by my colleague Cyprian, as far as grid and system protection might have to be done outside of the inverter. And also the consideration that if disconnection Disconnection must be uh, done if eyelading is detected at any time. So coming back to frequency uh, and look at the behavior of frequency and why frequency can increase or decrease within a grid. So electricity production and consumption must at all times be equal for the frequency to remain uh, stable. If not, then you'll have uh, frequency uh, variations. Overfrequency on one hand is caused by an overproduction compared to how much is being consumed. And therefore, this means that you must uh, reduce production for the frequency to stabilize. So a typical requirement will be that if the frequency continues to rise, then you must uh, trip the inverter or the inverter must turn off at the threshold. Then we come also and look at what causes other frequency then uh, and, and mention here that the other frequency scenario will be caused by more consumption compared to the production within the grid. And, the, and therefore to counter the, the situation of other, fre other frequency, production must be increased. So this is not possible without a PV system, as we had seen in the beginning, uh, depending on the distance you are from the transformer. If you are at the very last end of the connection and you do not have a PV system, you are pretty much without any means to control the, the, the changing frequency levels. But with a PV system, this would be possible by adjusting the reactive power component as well as the production of the inverter, the max production of the inverter. So in most cases, the low uh, frequency trip limits will be between 47.5 hertz uh, instead of 49.9, because as we know, 
the typical uh, hertz for the international market, most of it operate at 50 hertz. So if you are to trip just at three points below the nominal uh, frequency uh, threshold, then uh, you'd cause a lot of uh, on and off operation of the inverter. And therefore, the extended trip limit up to 47.5 hertz would allow the inverter to be able to respond, uh, depending on whether to increase or decrease the production to counter the changing frequencies. However, reaching the trip limit means that a huge amount of PV systems uh, might turn off at the same time, and a lack of generation and heavy power swings therefore might result. To be able to have a balanced uh, operation, uh, new guidelines uh, require or include the requirement for a frequency-dependent power reduction uh, instead of immediate uh, shutdown, and this is uh, also a case example for Germany. And therefore, we come and look at uh, how this behavior of grid-dependent power reduction as far as frequency and voltage is going to happen. Looking at the grid-dependent, uh, uh, grid-frequency-dependent power reduction, uh, we can look at this graph and try to understand what is going on. We have several key points uh, that we can see that are named uh, properly, starting from point number one to four. And we can see that at 50.3 hertz, this is the enable limit as far as frequency is concerned. And if, if you were to go upwards and reach 50.5 hertz, as an example, we could request that the inverter shuts off. And then as we go backwards towards 49.8 hertz, this is the other frequency enable limit. And then uh, at 49.7 hertz, as an example, this is the other frequency stop. So this is when the grid frequency uh, the power reduction is has implemented a stop frequency. So sometimes you do not implement a stop frequency, but in this case, a stop frequency is implemented at 49.7 hertz. And then we can see that uh, the actual power at the moment, the, the, the limit value is exceeded. And then what is the behavior of the inverter once the limit value is exceeded? So uh, on the upper limit, we have the inverter reducing the power output, as we can see, uh, the reduction gradient, uh, and then correspondingly to the reduction of power. And then on the lower limit of frequency, we have the inverter trying to increase the production so that the frequency goes up, up a bit. And if the frequency doesn't stabilize, as, as for this example, we can see that at 49.7 hertz, the inverter is actually stopping production. Then you also come into a scenario whereby um, the voltage is determining the power uh, reduction. And also we can consider several parameters here. So we have uh, V, which is the voltage enable limit. And then uh, we, we are looking at two derating gradients, which are number two and four. And these are derating gradients that are indicating a percentage reduction of power per voltage variation. And then number three, we are looking at what is the enable limit for other voltage as the voltage uh, continues to decrease. And then uh, the nominal power, the, the nominal voltage in the system. So as we see that uh, as the voltage is decreasing, we have the inverter trying to counter that by increasing the production and trying to bring the voltage in the grid to um, a level that is uh, sustainable for the inverter to continue operating. However, at some point, if the grid voltage continues to go low, then the inverter must shut down because this might mean that the power from the grid has been disconnected, maybe for maintenance purposes, and therefore the inverter must be able to detect this and switch off. We also have two other segments that we can also look at whereby the inverter is also actively trying to support the grid on the on the other side of it. And also uh, this is happening by reducing uh, the production to be able to counter any fluctuations within the grid. So all these parameters are very well implemented within the Fronius uh, inverter and the behavior to be able to support what is happening with the line voltage and frequency for the inverter to operate as long as uh, possible. So with that, we have basically come to the end of our training for today. Uh, and I hope you have gotten some very useful uh, information from our webinar. 
but if not, uh, we would like to encourage you to visit uh, uh, our website. You can get a lot of useful materials from there, even on advanced grid features for the Fronius inverters. And then also um, from our webinars that we have done in the past, you can also revisit them to refresh your, inf your knowledge on the various products and solutions. So you can go to the dedicated uh, playlist uh, on YouTube for the African market. And there are a lot of videos already that we have done for African market. For any direct uh, inquiries that you might have, I request you to get in touch with uh, any of us. For Southern Africa, get in touch with uh, Mohamed Sidat. For Western Africa, get in touch with Cyprian Okolo. And then for the Eastern African region, you get in touch with myself, David Mwangi. So um, that brings us to the end of our webinar today. And I would like 